Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast, where it's our goal to help you become the best financial advisor possible and drive the positive evolution of financial advice. Hub24 is an ASX-listed company with over $15 billion funds under management and one of the fastest-growing platforms in the market. Neither a bank nor part of a bank, Hub24 focuses entirely on connecting advisors to a broad range of investment solutions for their clients. Discover why other advisors think Hub24 are the best in the market and access the benefits of choice and efficiency for you and your clients with their market-leaning managed portfolio solution. To find out more, visit hub24.com.au. G'day, g'day. How's it going? What do you know? Strike the light. Clayton here. Um, here I am with Patrick Flynn. Now, Patrick and I, we've only ever ca- caught up via a third party application called LinkedIn. And uh, obviously, uh, if you've paid any attention to financial planning, as this audience typically does, you may have already seen mm-hmm. what Patrick's been doing. Um, out there in the market. I recently did a podcast with a good mate of mine, Fraser Jack. Um, Our podcast, the Jack Daniel podcast, shall be out pretty shortly. It's a nice little plug there. But, um, mate, it's it's great to always talk to people who are into innovation and financial advice and who are steeped in being involved in financial advice uh, without actually currently being an advisor. But if I'm right, you used to be an advisor, correct? Yeah, that's right. I was a, I was an absolutely mediocre advisor. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Mate, I, I feel like we, we're probably on the uh, on the same team on that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it sort of yeah, it was a it was a good journey to have been on, and I liked helping people in that way. Um, yes. But in all honesty, I could have been very happy giving a lot of advice to a lot of fact finds rather than human beings yep. and and whilst that was uh whilst it was rewarding i i discovered at a couple of points where uh you know i can have done the world's best bit of advice wonderful statement of a uh, sort of statement of advice a van gogh uh, statement of advice <laughs> and the, the clients wouldn't necessarily take it and that's because I, it took me some time to really get that human element that went into that and it it doesn't come natural to me. So uh, that was something where I thought, you know what, I could learn how to do that. I could try to really get my head around that. But honestly, I'd prefer not to. I'd rather just focus on process and helping those people um, just not directly, just doing it indirectly. Yeah, that's really interesting. And that is such a weird part about financial advice. You go and you do your degree and your certificates and you get all this education and you go to training days. Uh, you might even learn a bit about sales. And so you turn up and you, it's kind of like nothing can prepare you for someone looking you in the eyes and saying, you can make, you can ensure my life's going to be better. Right. Like that is a, that is a really, um, it's such a, like the, the mandate of a financial planner it's very hard to sort of prepare for until you're in the thick of it and um yeah when it comes down to it it's not the quality of the statement of advice it it matters you know how much buy-in you're getting from the client how much they trust you to deliver a, a good outcome and how clear it is that you're able to articulate to them and help them along that path and yeah there's there's never a piece of uh yeah, I just find that it, that comes with experience and really focusing on that specific thing to be able to deliver advice well. And to, you know, to consider the, the, the standard pathway that people have been sort of promised as a career path in terms of, you know, you come in, you got to do your groundwork, do some legwork, you're doing admin, then you become a power planner and then you become an advisor. It's almost the, the worst possible preparation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. To be a successful power planner is, you know, requires a lot of detail, a lot of analysis, and it's almost it's got a negative correlation between being a successful power planner and a successful advisor. Of course, everyone needs that grounding, but if you're shooting the lights out from a detail perspective, then you may. I'm not ruling it out, but odds are 
you're not able to shoot the lights out from a client engagement perspective? Yeah, I'd say as a general rule, like an, let's call it an 80-20. You know, it's probably yeah. an eighty twenty. You're probably you're probably spot on there. Um, yeah, I find it really interesting. the The people that can bridge that gap, I think, are you know freaks of nature, right? The people that can kind of go in there and have really good attention to detail, and then if they can take that attention to detail and put it towards um, a skill set that allows them to engage with someone on a deeper level and get their buy-in then yeah i mean they ended up being a, a fantastic a fantastic advisor um so if so you felt like you were more the attention to detail and uh and process driven and then so so you got out of advice or you got out of being an advisor i should say and then you went to innovation at aon is that what happened no, no, no. Uh, definitely a good few steps in between. So uh, when I was in practice, around about the time I really started to figure that out, we were we were growing really, really quickly. So we were, over my journey there, we were one advisor, two staff. And by the time I'd really pulled that back, we were at six advisors, including myself. And the um, so I kept a panel of about 50 clients that were really right in my wheelhouse the engineers and the teachers in the client base they were they were really at home with me <laughs> uh, but but you know the, the normal people uh, needed to, <laughs> to get help from someone else uh, and but even then it was a case of yeah sure I had my panel uh, small though it was and the um, but I deliver through the other advisors typically either working as a subject matter expert or supporting those advisors um, indirectly through making sure that the rest of the place worked really well. So that that was one point. And then with a couple of steps in between, by the time I got a chapter A on in the licensee, I was just focused on the technology initially, um, which naturally has an innovation component. But Absolutely. At the, as it started off, was really just about making sure the tech was doing what it was supposed to do it supposed to do and then then over time that grew out into then needing to expand I'd sort of identify that I'd done a lot of what I could do with the tech without changing the process that surrounded the tech so mm -hmm. that enabled us to expand the mandate and include power planning unit and then taking over the SOA process and the end-to-end -end device delivery process because you know the, the, it's like the good old Bill Gates quote technology will magnify the inefficiency or efficiency of whatever you're trying to do. So if we've got an inefficient process, we need to change the process. So yeah. I did a lot of that. Yep. And, uh, and then from there, we, um, we really looked to hand that over to somebody who could do the ongoing management of that better than I could. And I started moving my attention to a range of different projects that really sort of hit that, that innovation title. Uh, towards towards my last year there at Aon, mate. Um, technology is so I've I've, uh, I've actually just finished up, but I did twelve months of consulting with um, advisor ratings, helping them sort of develop a product that was uh, and it's soon to be launched. Pretty cool, so advisors can go on and rate products and services, and then compare those ratings oh. against each other, which is really cool. Yep. What I noticed during that first stage so i guess it's the first stage is just like collecting a, a lot of the feedback out of platforms insurance providers uh research houses and technology technology had by far the lowest net promoter score across the board so there so there, there obviously there were ones that were doing a little bit better than others mm. But uh, it was all in the negative. Now, yeah. there are many different ways to look at that. One of the ways I would suggest is advice is such a dynamic industry. You've got so much external pressure, regulations, legislation, royal commissions that change mm -hmm. things on a dime overnight. And then licensees then hand down new requirements if you're with a big licensee or if you're in a smaller one, you know, you, you've got an outsourced sort of solution there. But like ultimately 
that tech can never keep up delivering um, such a dynamic environment because tech's pretty static. It's got a long development cycle. You know, I mean, some of the best teams in the world can do it lean methodology, mm. but let's mm. face it, mm. most aren't doing that. So, um, so would you say that there's any other contributing reasons as to why advisors pretty much unanimously hate advice technology? Oh, I, I definitely think so. The, the, the key one I would say is just where your expectations are set. So when it comes to a fund manager or an insurer, it's not like we go around our daily business and engage stellar fund managers and insurers and then come back and go, oh, this one, this advice-focused one is lousy. You know, we're engaging Microsoft day-to-day, we're engaging Google, now we're engaging a world of apps. And those expectations are being set by our last technology experience. That's coming out of Silicon Valley. That's coming out at the millions of users scale, not the tens of thousands of users scale like we have here. And they're solving simpler problems like how to catch a ride share or, you know, how to do some word processing, things that are universal and simpler, whereas our advice tech is faced with the impossible challenge of trying to keep up with Silicon Valley-led expectations when they've only got a user base in the tens of thousands and uh, and it's much more complex for those reasons like you stated. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, in and before we move on to sort of the innovation stuff and, and Aon, I'm interested, what would you suggest as a singular most important takeaway for advisors to focus on when it comes to technology? My, I'm not going to do one. I'm going to cheat. I'm going to do two. Okay. <laughs> the, the first one would be to really begin with the end in mind. Uh, the old Stephen Covey seven habits, habit number two, begin with the end in mind. If you're you're looking at today's problem and you're not looking at the problem five years from now or depending on the speed and growth of your business, two years from now, whatever it might be, if you're not really planning with that end, then you're going to struggle to select the right tools that support you now. And that, that does take a bit of forward planning that I often don't see quite so much. All I hear will be things like, my SOAs take too long to produce. <laughs> yeah, now, yeah, yeah. You know, I totally get that. It's frustration. It's real and it costs money right now. I totally, totally. get that. Totally, yes. But is that going to be what drives your business in five years? SOA production speed? Probably not. I, actually, hopefully not. I really hope not. Um, the, other, the other problem that I see is for some of those ones that um, are good with their technology is that they won't, they won't focus. So it'll be a case of, you know, oh, there's X-Plan, there's Midwinter, there's Advisor Logic, there's Practify, there's other tools out there that are sprouting up all the time. And it's hard to bring that down to a focus and then just going, you know what, I've conducted a review, I've decided that it's going to be X-Plan that I stick with and then just sticking with it and reviewing it in two or three years' time. And even though that might seem like a long time, if you've constantly got a foot out the door, then you're never really going to invest in making that software work for you. And if you don't invest in making your software work for you, then it's not going to achieve the results. It doesn't matter what the software is. Man, they're, uh, they're really good points. Um, yeah, if, I feel like if I'd asked Adrian Patty, he just would have said something like, use Zapier. And then it's like, okay, <laughs> we use Zapier then. Um, <laughs> Which is a great tool. And, yeah. you know, it, it sort of forms part of that mix. So you, you've got to sort of have one, every business needs to have a source of truth. And that's got to be the one spot where you can confidently come back to and go, if we know this about the client, then it is represented here. Whatever that happens to be, you do need that one. And then you can use a Zapier or other things to sort of build a, build a best in class for, you know, best in class for video conferencing and best in class for email marketing and best in class for all these other tools. And you might well have those. And there's a lot more that can be done now than used to be able to be done even five years ago. And, and Zapier is part of that mix, even though it's been around a while. Yeah. 
Yeah. So look, it's definitely a, a good idea to be mindful of what you can plug into something. And that can help take the stress out of that, what's my core centre, because I know that, you know what, even if this isn't the best core centre because I've engaged a few best-in-class satellite options, I can be a little bit more nimble with what I change as my, as my centre. Um, so it, it can be part of that solution, that to Adrian's benefit. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, you've you got to pick something and, and run with it. I think I'm just disappointed that anyone would even suggest that Adrian might be remotely correct. All right, <laughs> moving on. Um, so, um, so, so you, you, you move across to, to Aon and you're part of the innovation um, team there, I guess. Like what, what, is, what does that mean and um, what, what was some of the stuff that you were doing? <laughs> the, it's naturally a really waffly, uh, vague, nebulous job title. But the, the, the main key there was to identify new opportunities, uh, to monitor the market, see what trends and changes there were taking place and then come up with uh, practical ways to turn that into um, improvements for how we do our day-to-day business. So that, that included some projects along the lines of uh, how we collect our data, looking at you know, what we call the fact-finding process, but really it's talking about the start of that client journey up until really prior to SOA. Typically, uh, there was you know, a range of ad hoc things in terms of how we engaged our aligned advisors, and we had the network of you know, between 180 and 200 different times aligned advisors. And then there was a, another aspect that I spent a lot of time on around digital advice and, and scaled advice and working with some different groups around how they uh, and the opportunities for digitising advice, initially in the scaled superannuation area, but mm-hmm. also looking at how that could be extended to the classic advice process. Um, so very hard to give that a job title, anything other than uh, innovation, because it's a little bit all over the place. Mate, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It's, I think if I was to structure what you've said in terms that I use frequently, which is an ascending transaction model, which basically you, it's how you can use your online assets to attract, to inform, to engage, uh, and to slowly get people interested in your ecosystem um, before they ever spend a dollar with you or a dime and, 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 and learning from you. And because I think, you know, in the modern world, um, people love to Google things. I remember reading once that 97% of people now Google things before, you know, they purchase, especially if it's a service that doesn't surprise me at, at all. And so if you are on the internet providing answers to these questions, then people are able to get to know you, to learn from you, to learn to trust you and to develop a, a bit, you know, a one way, but a, a relationship with you. Um, and so by the time that they sort of walk into the office, uh, it's very, it's very less about um, sales tactics and, and, and more so, well, the person is there, they're educated, they're informed, they know what you do and, and they want to uh, purchase from you. What, what's really interesting is a mate of mine, I get asked this a lot actually because, because you know, I'm super involved in advice, but I'm not an advisor. A lot of people ask me who I should, you know, who, who they should see as an advisor. And I, I've, landed, I've landed on a really good solution, which I've been using, I guess, for, I would say probably the last 12 months. And it's, um, t- well, tell me what you want because I've got a, bunch of advisors that I know and, and what's, what's important to you, what's your revenue or what's your income. And then I'll say, well, okay, well, here's a handful of advisors that I would suggest you go Google, have a look at. Um, and I won't tell you, uh, sorry, I won't tell them that you're coming in and you don't need to tell them that you know me and you're able to go through this completely transparent, apparently in a way that you're in control and all I've done is sort of limit the number, you know, rather than just opening the yellow pages and saying, okay, cool. Well, considering you talk about this, I've got a pretty wide network of advisors. You live in this location. Um, these are the people that I would go check out on the internet. And, um, and it's quite interesting because oftentimes 
people will come back and they've, they've had a chat with a few different advisors um, before they chat to the advisors that, that I, you know, the part of the groups that I've been, that I've recommended. And the difference in responses to going to people that someone's just found off the internet or going to people that they've built a relationship with looking at their stuff online is so completely different. And I, I can't explain exactly why that is, but a mate of mine literally last night was texting me the stuff that the financial planner was saying to him. And he goes, he's not a financial planner. He was uh, simply an insurance salesman. And this guy's in sales. Mm. So he knows sales like the back of his hand. Yeah. And he goes, yeah. and he goes like, um, he goes, yeah, that, that's not the kind of advice that I told him that I needed it. And I said, well, have you spoken to anyone that I recommended yet? And he goes, no, but I've been watching this stuff online and it looks a lot different. And, um, yep. and there's, there's just something about putting in the time and effort to build out how to attract and how to get people engaged in what it is that you do in a way that your sales skills necessary only have to be really small or to tip them over the line because sales skills really is just there to fill a gap in what your marketing process should be. So if you have a really good marketing process, then your sales skills only needs to be so small because they've already made their whole decision that without you in the room. And then you just say, well, do you like, now I'm just going to apply everything that you've learned specifically to you. And uh, man, like if the, if people are able to do, if advisors are able to do that, well, I've just seen so many businesses do really well using that strategy. But to your point about data capture and things like that, that all becomes a huge part of it, right? So you mm, need to agreed. be able, you need to have sort of like systems and processes set up so that when people come into your ecosystem that you're capturing them at different points and it's feeding into a, a CRM and then you're able to sort of put out the marketing to them. And, and it, it definitely blows my mind that there's people operating that aren't doing that at the moment. It's an interesting thing. And one of the, one of the aspects of that that I try to work with in, in some of the consulting work that I do is really trying to build what I, what I, what the, the problem that I often find myself trying to solve is what I call the trust canyon. So online marketers figured this stuff out years ago. And that'll be that you want to make the amount of trust and the amount of effort that somebody puts into their relationship with you or your brand the smallest amount possible. So that's why we have things like lead magnets, for example, that everybody talks about. Because I've come to the site and I need to do the smallest amount to engage you. Cool, I need to give you my email address and risk that you're going to spam the snot out of me or potentially sell it. Right, small investment. You only need to make a small sale, so to speak, to get yep. them over that little hurdle. And then the next little hurdle may be the smallest, most no-brainer possible purchase. So in an advice context... That could be like a paid seminar or that could be some sort of um, ad hoc you know, goal interview or something like that or you know, goal setting appointment or something which is really small, narrow in scope. And you know what? I gave over my $100, $200 and I didn't get screwed. They delivered yeah. what they said they'd deliver. Great. And you, you're doing a couple of things in that process. Is one that you're building that trust but you're also keeping the value delivery up with the amount of effort that you're asking the client to put in because the, the traditional financial planning process that doesn't engage any of these kinds of strategies involves clients putting in a whole lot of effort in terms of filling out back lines, ending meeting, and a whole lot of trust in terms of how they how you know, much data they give you, how much access to their stuff that they grant by signing third parties with authorities. And then typically, far the little bits of tidbits of information we give in our meetings, there's no value until the SOA stage. And yeah. that might be arguably of no value. Yeah. <laughs> it, it might be great value, but depends on the client. Um, yes. And then really you haven't delivered all your value until implementation stage and you've asked them to commit thousands of dollars along that way or at least, you know, take a risk along that way. And there's that huge canyon between effort and trust given and value delivered. 
So the more we can close that canyon, then the more likely people are to go down that journey and enjoy the journey that they're going down. Yeah. And I'm super guilty of that. Like, and, and uh, I mean, I was born in 83, which makes me a, a millennial, but I'm an elder. I'm an elder millennial. So I, 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 I don't know. I'm probably far less tech savvy than I should be. When I opened my company, so um, I'd come from tax accounting and then did power planning and this SMSF practice. And then I did a year at AMP Horizons and I launched a, a Heroes uh, practice off the back of that. I remember... This is like, I, I remember sort of reaching out to people, um, you know, who had an AMP product and saying, you know, I, I like I'm the advisor on your product. Um, so, so first of all, they haven't had a choice, right? They, I've, uh-huh. I've just turned up one day and said, Hey, I'm your guy. So could you, like, could you imagine? And then I said, look, because I know so much of your information already, not a great thing to say, because I know so much of your information already, just bring your tax file number in because then if we combine those two bits of data, then while we're in the meeting, we can just call all your products and services to find out everything that you've got. Mate, <laughs> mate, like I can't express how bad I was at this. And I, 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 I'm a millennial, right? So like, yep. so, so I, I, when I talk about this sort of stuff, and I rattle it off now, right? And I, 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 cause I've got the framework in my head and it's cause I've spent a hell of a lot of time thinking about it and, and sort of, you know, o- over the, the four years that I had my business, I got a lot better at it. And I, and I paid a sort of yep. a decent chunk of money to get trained on how to do that. Yep. But it's not insanely difficult. There's, there's definitely that as well. Like I remember the first time I saw, a landing page that I delivered and I was like, Oh my God. And then I remember the first email that dropped in and I was like, Oh my God. And like a lot of this stuff, you can just be super simple. Like you don't have to figure out these multi 20, 30 step journeys. Like literally it could be as simple as this, get lead pages, which is a thousand bucks a year, build a very simple landing page, put a, a form on there. I mean, this is all coded in. So all you need to like, it's all done yep. for you. And then, uh, do it, do a small little ebook or whatever, put it in the landing page and then just send it out to your LinkedIn connections or, or whatever. Like yep. it doesn't have to be the most difficult thing in the world, but even just getting one person to drop in, you're like, Oh wow. Like that's, that's interesting. Yeah. It's, it's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting problem because there's, like, granted, you've got all of that, and all of that's true. But at the end of the day, what most advisors are, get, where most advisors are getting their business from is still even, uh, even the younger advisors is still from word of mouth, because it's a relationship-based business. It's something that isn't readily understandable to most people unless you've already had an advisor. Understanding what advice is about is a challenge. Uh, and we see that in some of the research that you see coming out about you know, how much advisors who have parents, that ha- sorry, clients who had parents that had an advisor tend to trust an advisor more readily than people that, whose parents did not have an advisor. And it's because they've got, in large part, a clue around what an advisor actually does. So we, we can have all of these sort of landing pages and stuff. And, and they're definitely part of that mix. They're definitely part of that journey of engaging a client with little baby steps before you just go, hey, my SOA fee is $1,500 and my implement flatation fee is $2,000. You've got to have something along that journey. But the reason why I put that focus on to making sure we collect our data in a a better way uh, is because it's a common problem where even when we've got that relationship, it's just such a slog. And there's so much data that we need and the amount of data that we need to collect is only going up and the amount of confidence that we have to have to proceed with our advice is, is only going up. So the, the more seamless we can make that and the more, um, the more value we can deliver along the way for that journey so that every time they give us a bit of data, they get something back, the, the, better, off, the better off the clients will be and the more they'll, they'll engage advice. And that's one of the things that I was really trying to, trying to solve and continue to try and solve with, uh, with individual practices. 
Yeah. What <clears throat> What would be now? You've already given us two tips. Do you, do you have a? Mm. Do you, what What would you say is uh, one of the best ways to inform, engage, attract, get the attention of? Like, what What's a really good first baby step? <sighs> Another good question. <laughs> okay, the, for, for a lot of advice is it's honestly just getting a good website up. In yeah. so many cases, I see the average firm has either got trash on there or they've got something that they built themselves. It's quite simple, but also quite limiting. So I'll, um, and I, I really, really do see this all the time where you'll, I, I see it as the equivalent of you go into a restaurant and you go to the toilet and it's disgusting as hell. And you, you have the natural conclusion, well, if this is what the bathroom looks like, then the kitchen's probably not that much better. And if I'm a client in 2019, if I go to a website and the website's not slick, and I, when I say slick, I, I mean to say it's not well-structured, it's not well-designed, doesn't look like you're a successful firm, then I start to wonder, well, if they can't really manage their online presence, can they manage my retirement savings? <laughs> and the answer may well be no. Yeah. Uh, interestingly, the answer may well be yes as well, but you're sending the wrong mm. message. You know what I mean? Like that's yeah. the crazy thing because there probably, there probably is so many advisors out there with shitty websites, but they're probably good advisors, but they're not sending mm. the message that they're good advisors. And, it's a weird sort of like, and I do sort of get it. Like there's certainly a bit of, I guess, pride where you're like, my work should speak for myself, or like for itself, I should say, um, you know, and my reputation precedes me and how my clients feel about me is far more important. Yeah. And like, I get all of that, like, like really well. And I, I can, I can sympathize with that. Um, it's just unfortunate that that's not how the majority of people are going to, they're not going to agree with that sentiment. They are going to walk in. It's like looking at a dirty toilet and it's like grabbing the hand yeah. of your partner and saying, actually, we're going home. We're not, we're not eating here. And actually I was talking with an advisor the other day and uh, from, what I, from what I gather, it sounds like he does incredibly good work but it's like the uh, Bondi hipster coffee shop that no one's meant to know about. And that's why it's so cool and so good because no one knows about it. It's like, well, <laughs> if no one knows about it, you might be the best advisor any, anywhere. But if you're underground, that doesn't really work in our context. <laughs> um, and, mate, uh, we spoke about it very briefly, and I know we just wanted to touch on it very briefly, but you mentioned... Um, there's a project that you've just recently concluded after working on for a while, some cards. What, what's all that about? Yeah, so I've got a couple of projects that I've been sort of wrap, wrapping up or doing, not wrapping up, it's not the right word, everything's been continuously improved, but uh, recently launched. So one of those is, yeah, these life goal cards. So that's one thing where as a process guy and somebody who learned everything he did know about being an advisor, through observation and through development of process was that, um, that there was a gap where I know that there are lots of advisors that are not having great conversations with their clients around goals in particular. Mm. Um, I'd see that at the, at the other end of what I'd be doing when I'd see what power planners are getting delivered, when I see the sorts of stuff that compliance and other teams would pick up, a lot of that would be fundamentally based on bad goal conversations. And if you think about that as, as compared to some of the other work that we do, where if somebody came to us and said, yeah, no, you don't need a risk profile me, I know I'm growth, people would just say, yeah, yeah, that's lovely, Clayton, but I'm going to just check that you're growth, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But somebody comes in, they're not expecting to talk about their goals and dreams, they're in deep right brain mode, they're thinking... I got to tell him about my super. He might want to ask me about insurance. I hope he doesn't. All that sort of stuff. And then you go, hey, by the way, tell me what are your dreams? They're going to go, ah, yeah. oh, uh, my dreams are to have enough funds in retirement and make sure my family's 
protected. They're not going to say that. I'll get some insurance. They might call, even call a goal. It's just like, no one has that goal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so there was a, you know, a behavioral approach aspect that was really lousy in there. And I thought that there could be a, a process fix there that could yeah, right. facilitate really good conversation. Um, not, re- not replace them. They're not a set and forget sort of thing, but just a tool of trade that an advisor could use to have really good conversations. So they're, they're fairly simple. They're a bunch of flashcards that an advisor can use. We've got some other supporting stuff around scripts and tools and documentation that helps them to have a good, good conversation with clients and do the stuff that I struggled to do as an advisor because yes. I, I didn't have killer goal conversations with clients in part because my average client was in their 50s and I looked about 12, which made it harder. Um, but, <laughs> but anything that you can, you can equip someone with to sort of go, you know what, this is normal to talk about goals here. It's not, mm. it's not a weird thing. It's weird to talk about goals in any other context. But we've got a process, we've got a, we've got a tool, like, like a calculator, like you know, a modelling tool. These sorts of things are tools of trade that, that normalise this sort of stuff. Just as when you go to a doctor, they pull out the stethoscope, it's totally normal that they whack that on your chest and whack that on your back. Um, you know, it's, it's very similar. Wow, that's, that's pretty interesting. I could see something like that being used with, a, with, with your engineer-style clients because, mm. yeah, like you, you would get those, you know, the HD HDBMI or whatever it is, um, when you've got your four squares and then the, the people that are in that sort of that bottom right, sorry, bottom left, to the really attention to detail, the, yeah, the engineers, the, that kind of stuff, the teachers. I always struggled with talking with those because I was probably the, the flip side of um, your style of advice because I actually f- like very rapidly dove head deep into this sort of like – I end up calling it just a lifestyle framework. So I, I, my advice was really a financial and a lifestyle framework. And, um, and so people like that would come in and they'd sort of really struggle with what I was trying to say. And I'm like, no, dude. I mean, like, what do you want out of life, bro? <laughs> like, you know, it's probably sounding <laughs> like that to them, right? Despite the fact that I was wearing a suit, I, I, they were looking at me like I was a little bit crazy. And so, one of the cool things I learned from Andrew rocks um, on the podcast on this X, Y podcast many, many moons ago was he would find out um, what the style of communication someone was simply by asking them or getting them to do a short test and then would use the tools appropriate for that individual in that, in that meeting. And, and like I remember how much that just blew my mind that he would like he, he just accepted that there were four types of people he accepted that it was difficult to pick what type of person someone was um, until you know they're looking at you strangely or they're smiling intently and yep. so he would simply get them to do some level of identity test and he would prepare for that meeting to yeah to speak to the person how, how they wanted to be spoken to and i think something like that would be really good for people who are process orientated so even if the advisor because i'm sure you've probably created it as a tool for the advisor to use and sort of to leverage you know to expand their skill set because a lot of advisors are that sort of attention to detail but i tell you even if you're not that let's say you were more even like myself and struggled to speak to people who were the engineers and teachers. I mean, a tool like that would have been really priceless for someone like me to be able to communicate what it is that I felt was valuable to them. So, man, that's really cool. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, it's, um, it's been an interesting ride, and I've been putting a lot of research into it, but a lot of it comes back to that journey that I've been putting a lot of consideration into. So there's... Uh, there's that around you know, how we engage our clients in that phase between when they reach us, when they contact us, and when they, uh, and when you know they start to sign on for an SOA, or you're having those serious conversations around formalising the engagement, making commitments. 
And then the other the other project that I've been doing is been around websites precisely. So looking at a, a website tool that makes sense for financial advisors so that they're not paying to recreate the wheel every time because I see a lot of sites where they have tried to do it themselves and they're lacklustre or a lot of times where people will have engaged to a web design firm and they're paying to recreate the wheel every time and those firms don't necessarily understand financial advice. So spend, spend a bit of time putting something around that so that we can, you know, especially with my consulting clients, it works really nicely when you see them starting to go down that journey and we, we start sort of at the top of the funnel, so to speak, and then we move our way down in that trust, building that trust and trust and engagement right throughout the whole process. Yeah, um a couple of buddies of mine, uh, Jess and Glenn, they've got a, a company called Fox and Hair and their website is just super cool. You know, it, it, you go on and yeah, there's, there's, it's like walking into, you know, the most gorgeous bathroom using that analogy that you've ever been yeah. in your life. You're like, oh my God. Um, yeah, it's like it's, look 97% of people they're searching online they're definitely going to go to your website before they ever meet with you word of mouth is priceless but 100% you need to look you need to it's just on your Sunday best right like it, I, I think it goes without saying that um, yeah that's that's pretty much a standard so that's man that, that's all really cool um, thanks so much for coming on if anyone wants to reach out say hello learn more track what it is that you do uh you know how, how do they reach out to you uh patrickflynn.info is the best place to go so i've got a little button down there where i say if you'd like to have a chat see a little bit more about what i'm doing or see what i might be able to do for you then there's a little button down there you book a virtual coffee and and we'll start with a catch-up the best way awesome man well thanks so much for coming on super really appreciate it awesome great to have a chat Cheers, Clayton. Cheers, man. Thank you.